joining us to look closer at this story, Chris Cochran, Associate Professor of Politics at the University of Toronto. Uh, Chris, let's get into a bit of the nitty-gritty first. How will this challenge by Christine Elliott move forward? What's built into the PC Constitution for this? Well, the PC Constitution doesn't give her much room at all for a challenge, so I assume she's going to have to do this outside of the Constitution. The decision is supposed to be final, so the decision last, reached last night is the final decision according to the rules. Uh, the issue will be the question around the ballots. Now, I don't know if these contested ballots are ballots that haven't been counted and she's saying they should be counted or ballots that have been counted and she's saying they shouldn't be counted. But either way, this is a real mess for the party. I mean, the whole thing's been a mess, but this is a spectacular mess for them uh, last night. All right, so let's talk about what her other options are. Are you saying she'll have to go through a legal avenue? Well, she may try that. I don't know that there's any recourse. Uh, I don't know of any higher law that would apply here beyond some finding of impropriety in the process itself. The rules of the process are a bit unusual. I mean, this is a very potentially remarkable result in that she may well have won not only the popular vote, which seems to be the case, she may also have won the most number of ridings and yet still lost the election. And the only way for that to have happened would have been that Doug Ford won by a larger margin in ridings with fewer members. So he targeted ridings that had fewer members and the way their rules are set up, one vote counts as one point all the way up until 100 members. But in a, in a riding with, say, 1,000 members or more, one vote counts just a small fraction of that, just a tenth, in fact. So the more members, the fewer the votes count. And it looks like Doug Ford may well have won on that, on that rule. Yeah, the idea here, I guess, was they were trying to give equal weight to all of their ridings. Exactly. I mean, if they, if and, and it may even be the case here that they did the opposite of that in some ways, because, uh, uh, you know, if it turns out that, in fact, the ridings that ended up tipping it were the ones with very few members and, and we, nobody really has great data because uh, the information certainly hasn't been forthcoming, uh, then they may find themselves in the situation where they have a leader elected primarily because he was popular in ridings that have virtually no members, Got even it. if he was popular in fewer ridings. So it's, a, it's an example of how in a close election, the rules can be decided decisive, and unless those rules are absolutely slam-dunk defensible, then you're stuck trying to promote the legitimacy of a leader on the basis of a technicality that, admittedly, if this, in fact, is the case, he very, very cleverly took advantage of. All right. So, Chris, let me ask you about the fact that he won on a third ballot. That's what we understand. What does that say to you, if anything? Well, I mean, it was, a, it was a close race between the two of them. I actually thought that Doug Ford may well have won even on a second ballot when Granick Allen supporters dropped off and, and went to him. I expected that, and as they did go to him. I thought Christine Elliott uh, actually would have had a chance if it went through to the third ballot. But it, as it turned out, Granick Allen supporters were more pro-Ford, it seems, than, uh, than Mulroney supporters were pro-Elliott. And so that is, in fact, one of the, the key points here that seems to have decided the, uh, decided the outcome. So the, the outcome itself isn't a surprise. The fact that it was chaotic isn't altogether a surprise. What remains to be seen are the technical details of how a candidate actually came to win with a smaller share of the popular vote and winning a fewer number of ridings. What do you think about uh, the look of the party, the perception of the party, after the last two months, sort of as of yesterday, what are people looking at the PC party and thinking and saying? Well, I still think because the current Liberal government is so unpopular that there's a lot of people who think that any change will be good change. And there's certainly a lot of Conservatives who feel they have no other choice. They're not going to go and park their vote with the NDP, and they're certainly not going to vote for the Liberals. That's probably the only thing that might save the Conservatives here, because this has really been a fiasco for them right from the get-go. It certainly suggests, and this will un undoubtedly be a key point for the leaders of all of the other parties, <clears throat> that they... They can't govern themselves. How can they govern a party? And it's just been a, a spectacular failure at every single step of the way. So it's not as if this is you know, a couple of things that just came out and blew out of proportion. Every part of this has been a, has been a failure, it seems. So uh, unless they can get this settled and move on, as they haven't been able to do despite trying over the past couple of weeks, it's not going to look very good for them going into the next election, no matter what the polls say right now. Chris Cochran, sir, thanks as always for your time. I appreciate that. My pleasure.